Good evening, and on behalf of the Future Forum at the LBJ Library, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Ayman Siddiqui, and I have the privilege of serving on the Board of Directors for the Future Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. And I'm beginning to think that with a name like Ayman, that might be why I was asked to do the introductions tonight. <laughs> Before we begin, I'd like to share a little bit about the Future Forum. We are an initiative of the LBJ Presidential Library dedicated to fostering bipartisan discussions, networking opportunities, and community events that inspire elevated political discourse and engagement here in Austin. Our mission is rooted in one of President Lyndon B. Johnson's favorite Bible verses, come, let us reason together. If you're not already a member, I encourage you to sign up tonight. Members enjoy exclusive benefits, including early access to events, happy hours, networking opportunities, and special perks at the LBJ Library. If you'd like to learn more, please visit Natalia Morgan, who's at the back. Now onto tonight's event. This evening, we are honored to welcome the Ambassador of Ireland to the United States, Geraldine Byrne Nason, as a part of our annual Women in Leadership series. Ambassador Byrne Nason has had a distinguished career in public service, holding senior roles in Brussels, New York, Paris, Vienna, and Helsinki. She previously served as Ireland's ambassador to the United Nations, where she championed and later led Ireland's term on the UN Security Council. She also chaired the UN Commission on the Status of Women. These are just a few of the highlights of her remarkable career. We're privileged to have her here with us in Austin at the LBJ Presidential Library as we celebrate 100 years of diplomatic relations between Ireland and the United States. Tonight, she will share her experiences and insights as we look to the future of this vital partnership. Moderating tonight's discussion is Corey McClagan, the statewide managing editor of the Texas Newsroom, a public radio journalism collaboration that unites public radio stations across the state. She's also been at the Texas Tribune, for those of you who live here, and at the uh, Austin American Statesman, and we're very lucky to have her. There'll be time for questions at the end of the program. For now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ambassador Geraldine Byrne Nason and Corey McClagan. Well, thank you all so much, and thank you, Ambassador, for being here. What a perfect moment to have this conversation with this 100-year anniversary just having happened last month uh, of the diplomatic relations between Ireland and the United States. But we'll get to that in a moment. I want to start with Texas. Um, I understand you were hanging out at the governor's mansion yesterday. I was in torrential rain under an umbrella, which was not what was uh, advertised as a Texan welcome. <laughs> but, uh, uh, having said that, the warmth of the reception uh, made up for all of that. So it was my first appointment in a, in a busy, busy, busy four-day program which has been brought together by a superb Consul General here in Austin, whom you all know, Robbie, Robbie Hull, and his excellent and new Vice Consul, mm -hmm. uh, Dylan Hennessy, who joined us this evening. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, in the next couple of days, I've been in here in Austin for the last couple of days, and we'll move off tomorrow onto Houston, where I'll spend uh, 24, 48 hours doing some work there as well. Nice. Well, Irish people have been in Texas for a long time. There were actually Irishmen who died at the Battle of the Alamo. There were. Um, there were 11 of them, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and today there's about 1.7 million Texans yeah. who identify as having Irish heritage. Yeah. Um, we have an Irish member of Austin FC, John Gallagher. Yes. And Austin and Dublin are both tech hubs. So what do you see as the future of the Ireland-Texas relationship? Well, the first thing to say is I see it as bright and growing, mm -hmm. and that's why I was delighted that it's a forum on the future here that were, uh, that were uh, received by this evening. You know, the Irish uh, history in the United States is a deep one. It's mm -hmm. a meaningful one, a painful, complicated one. People left um, the island that I'm so proud to represent uh, over the course of the last 200 years, really not by choice, but mm -hmm. out of necessity, often out of absolute sheer poverty and hunger. Um, and as they did that, of course, many of them came to settle. Some, like Hugh O'Connor, who came here to Texas in mm -hmm. the 1700s, settled here. But the majority of them settled in the northern part of the United States. So our main body of Irish Americans, uh, as we think of them, are really in the two big coastal, New York and San Francisco, in Boston and Chicago. 
But over a, a decade ago, the Irish government began to look at um, how we were represented here in relation to the way your demography, um, your economy was developing. And we saw that there was a particular draw south. Um, I often think it's almost like gravity. I'm at that age where I recognize <laughs> what, uh, what gravity means. Um, so uh, the government began uh, very perspicaciously here to, a decade ago to establish uh, the consulate in Austin because we saw this as the future. We're watching horizons we know the United States is always about the next thing. It's always about the next opportunity, the next idea. And because we're in so embedded here in the United States, we watch that very carefully. So we opened here in Austin, we've opened in Atlanta, we most recently opened in Miami, and we have a consulate now in um, Los Angeles as well. That makes eight outer offices of the embassy that I'm uh, running in in Washington where we are advancing Ireland's interests. And here in Texas, while it's 1.7, so you're slightly under the national average of 10% of state's population. For example, Boston, one in four identify as being Irish. But this is a growing population here in mm -hmm. terms of an Irish diaspora. And it's a new and young and vibrant diaspora. And it's linked into your own economic um, dynamism, as I would see it here. So the, the investment you've made in the Texan economy here in high tech, in, um, in fintech, in pharma, in biotechnology, I know the nuclear industry is building up here. We have the brightest and the best of our young people interested in coming here. So the Irish government wanted to solidify that relationship mm -hmm. and give us the opportunity to be part of your next chapter as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, now, as you mentioned, the United States and Ireland also have a very long history. Um, President Clinton was involved in the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the peace accord designed to bring an end to the decades of violence uh, in Northern Ireland known as the Troubles. President Biden was in Ireland last year celebrating his Irish heritage and also marking the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. How do you expect the relationship between Ireland and the U.S. to change with the election of President Trump? Well, look, you've mentioned two high points. And for me, since I took on this job two years ago, a real high point with President Biden. Um, I have to get this out. A louds man. We're very linked to our counties in Ireland. And I was proud to go with him to County Louth. We so, so appreciate what um, President Clinton, what Senator George Mitchell did for Ireland in the peace process. Mm -hmm. Truth is, there's always been a bipartisan dimension to our relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I began my career when Ronald Reagan came to visit Ireland in 1984, and we've had sub support subsequently from other um, uh, across the aisle, Republican and Democratic administrations. You know, we worked uh, well with the previous Trump administration. It was a new world. Uh, there, there was a new way of doing business. Um, and there was a little bit of a charting of, of new pathways uh, during the last administration. We, of course, and it's my job to watch <laughs> elections and to watch what election and campaign promises look like. And, you know, I would have to say some of the, the promises that President Trump made during President-elect Trump made during the campaign raised some pause for thought for us, particularly in the domain of uh, trade and investment, which of course is so fundamental for Ireland's relationship with the United States. Um, we can talk more about the detail of that, but on the big picture of the relationship, I'm confident that Ireland as a long-standing partner of the United States, as one where our, I like to say we're proud of the way Irish people came and helped to build this great country. We'll continue to work forward with the United States. We haven't always agreed on everything, either during Clinton, Obama, Biden's um, tenure, nor indeed will we, likely, with uh, your new President Trump. But on the other hand, we will find ways to work with you. Ireland is above all, we're independent, I always call us a feisty island, but we're agile and we're partners. By definition, to survive as a small island, partnership is really how you chart yourself on the global stage. And we will find ways to work with the incoming administration. There are particular parts of policy where we won't see eye to eye, and Ireland uh, will stay true to our values and principles. Um, 
we're an unusual country maybe in that we always home to fundamental values and principles, but we're also very practical and pragmatic as a small five million people on the island of Ireland. It's existential for us that our economic and political relationship with you is managed well, and above all, the link between our peoples remains solid because that's what's at the heart of the relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. We can talk treaties, we can talk tariffs, we can talk tit-for-tat trade wars. It's the Irish people in the United States, the people of this great country, including of Texas, um, who have, in a way, woven the tapestry of our relationship. And from an embassy perspective, we will continue to work very hard to make sure that's in good order. Mm -hmm. in, anything in particular you're referring to when you say you don't see eye to eye, are you thinking of tariffs, for example? Yes. I mean, broadly speaking, on trade policy, Ireland is one of the most open trading economies in the world. Mm -hmm. we, we actually liked what's not PC to say anymore, globalization. We liked open free trading. Clearly, there's a move, not just here in the United States, but in other parts of the world, to more of a protectionist mode. That's not something that works for the Irish economic model. The United States um, is the number one foreign direct investor into Ireland, but it's really important that I say this quickly after that, that Ireland is the seventh source of foreign direct investment into the United States. When you think of all the big economic actors on the global stage, that my country is the seventh, it makes me proud. I repeat it all the time, obviously. <laughs> but it is pretty spectacular. Uh, in the European Union, there are only two countries who are bigger investors here. The idea that we would have a, a tit-for-tat tariff war where the United States would slap tariffs on products coming Irish whiskey, Irish butter, people always mention those to me. But there are European products that are very important, pharmaceutical products, for example, coming in here into your market. That would immediately generate a response in Europe. The trade policy for members of the European Union is a common policy. It's managed by the European Union. So we will be part and parcel of whatever happens as a broad response. And it is absolutely not in Ireland's interest to get into a tit for tat. So on tariffs, um, first of all, we think they're a blunt instrument. They will cost the American consumer more. Um, they will certainly have an effect on inflation. Um, and we believe that they will have a dampening effect on investment. So we want to get to the table to start talking. President-elect Trump has spoken a lot about surpluses. He's, he's unhappy with surpluses. Um, you know, there are ways of addressing that, which is uh, to look at supply and demand and to produce more wherever we are. We have ways of managing this. We also have international bodies who help us to manage that. I know that broader international system isn't uh, one that's top, uh, top choice for many Republican voters, but there is, maybe I'll finish on this point on trade if I may, mm -hmm. there is a bigger picture uh, related to trade other than simply getting your butter, your honey, your pharmaceuticals for the best price possible. It, this trading system fits into a wider framework of international peace and security. I always say you don't sell much butter in a conflict zone. You don't manage your, to grow your economy in unstable times. Businesses love predictability. I hear from your big investors every day in the week that Ireland is an attractive venue for them because we're predictable, we're stable. We have a stable political environment. We have great talent and a track record, but predictability, sustainability is critical. And if you introduce a tariff trade war, you upset that entire environment. It's not a productive way to proceed in our view. And we hope that when, when your new administration arrives, some of the you know, strongly felt views that we express will be understood better when we can actually have an engagement. We hope we can speak before we act. Well, we do like that Kerrygold butter in our house. Okay. <laughs> I have a fun story about Kerrygold. Let's, let's hear it, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell my fun story. 
So I, um, I, my last job uh, before I assumed this role two years ago was ambassador to the Security Council, as, your, uh, as Eamon said at the introduction. And so on my first weekend, my son said, Mom, there's a Safeway store, which I'd never heard of locally. This is where we have to now do our shopping. So I went along, and I was looking for Kerrygold. Yeah. And as I reached in to get the Kerrygold, a man put his hand on my arm, and he said, excuse me, are you the Irish ambassador? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I immediately said, oh, my goodness. I said, um, I was in my jeans, I may have had a baseball hat on, I don't know. And I said, well, I am. Is it because I'm buying Kerrygold? And he said, uh, actually, I'm an Italian, Italian humanitarian aid worker, and I watched you on the Security Council, and I recognized you. So I said to him, well, actually, my new job is selling Kerrygold. So. <laughs> it's a true story. OK, that's a good one. <laughs> Um, we're going to switch topics to something a little more serious. Um, so abortion, uh, it's, it's legal in Ireland under certain circumstances, but between 1983 and 2018, it was not. What do you think the U.S. can learn from Ireland's experience? Well, the first thing I'll say is that I'm very lucky and grateful to represent a progressive society in Ireland uh, today where we were the first country in the world to by referendum introduce marriage for all and we now have under uh, certain conditions access to abortion. I went to college uh, in 1979 when uh, there was no access, free access to contraception. Mm -hmm. In 1974 um, women who married in the public service had to resign. So I would never be, I'm a married woman with a child, I would never be in this role had that marriage bar pertained. I'm saying all that because I'm always very loath to say that we have lessons to give to anyone. Mm. It took my uh, country, my society, a very long time to understand how women could fully integrate in society and have their rights respected um, in a way that didn't upset the broader institutional framework of our society writ large. The Roman Catholic Church played a role in that. A very conservative part of Irish society played a role in that. Um, it was the death of a woman, um, Savita Halepanavar. As a woman, I will never forget her. Um, she um, caused uh, the country to stop in its tracks. She died um, because... Her waters broke early, and um, she en entered into septic shock, and um, the, it was, at the time, not legal to abort her child. Um, as it happens, I'm telling you a lot of personal stories here. I delivered a child at 29 weeks. My only son was born at 29 weeks, but I was Savita for 20 weeks because I was in hospital from 20 weeks, exactly the same condition. Um, it was a shocking situation for any woman to be in that her life could not be saved. Um, but it was a very deeply divisive uh, debate in, in my country for decades. I think both the education of young women themselves and the way in which our society began to settle down in terms of the idea that women are fundamentally entitled to manage their own bodies and have control of their own bodies. But it became a more public discussion rather than a political debate. That humanitarian instinct in everyone when Savita died was just, it was just so shocking that it came home that the reality was not that everyone will be queuing up on Monday morning for abortion on demand, mm -hmm. that these are life-saving opportunities that people need. But it came with the broader, broader swathe of women finding their place in society in Ireland. So, you know, I, I can only hope that um, in our case, we were, if I'm blunt about it, we were moving forward. We were giving women a right they didn't have before. We were acquiring rights we didn't have before. What I find deeply tragic about the United States, without saying I'm giving you any lessons, is you're surrendering rights. You had set the bar, you had made the ground, you had um, actually you know, made the case as well as 
the legal framework that you showed us all how to move through, and now we see it being unwound. I know it's a very personal issue, as well as a political issue, but I think uh, access and fundamental rights, we're a country that believes in fundamental human rights, and women's rights are human rights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shifting to the United Nations, um, when you were on the UN Security Council, you and your colleagues had the very easy task of maintaining international peace and security. Um, how can a small country like Ireland take on such an enormous task? Well, I will say it was with uh, great courage and fortitude, but also conviction. You know, uh, there are 15 member states on the Security Council, five of those um, I would say, anachronistically sitting there, out of uh, a right to be there, never tested, never voted in, the can't be members. voted out, uh -huh. the permanent members, mm -hmm. the five nuclear powers. Um, the rest of us, the 10 other countries, are elected. And for a country of our size, putting your hand up to sit at that iconic horseshoe table in New York, to your point, to maintain international peace and security is not something we take on lightly. Mm -hmm. So we do it once in a generation. Mm -hmm. You actually have to have the support of two thirds of the majority of the UN, two th a two thirds majority of the UN, mm -hmm. to be elected to the Security Council. So in many ways I argue countries like Ireland who get elected have will say great legitimacy, if I don't say greater legitimacy than others to be sitting there. Um, but what we did was made sure, and our conviction was, that we would be representative of the views of the two thirds of the General Assembly who voted us on. We weren't on there with an agenda that was driven by Ireland's foreign policy interests. We were a representative of the General Assembly. We represented small island states. We represented particularly small island states who of course have climate challenges that are existential for them. We represented women. We've been talking about women. Um, we went through the, your withdrawal from Afghanistan and the return of the Taliban. Um, we were represented particularly people, our history has helped, helped shape our foreign policy, particularly people who are hungry. And there are one in eight people on the globe today who, who are hungry. Um, one, in four, one in four suffer from malnutrition. Mm -hmm. We worked on the link between conflict and hunger mm -hmm. and tried to advance some of the discussions on the Security Council to see that they're intimately linked. You can't, you can't plant and grow food if they're shooting over your head. So, you know, we, we adopted a sort of a, a vulnerable humanitarian approach we also managed to pass a, one of the first ever resolutions on we're peacekeepers by nature. So we believed we should bring that history to the table. Mm -hmm. So we tried to work on what happens not when you put the peacekeepers on the ground, because I don't know if anyone in the audience knows who one of the biggest peacekeeping nations is on, on the globe at the moment. It's China, as it turns out. It offers huge numbers of troops. but. In the UN peacekeeping operation, what happens when peacekeeping troops move off? Ireland has been a peacekeeper for gener we're the, the longest unbroken service as peacekeepers in the world are Irish, the Irish Defence Forces. But when they move away, what happens to civilians? What happens to girls walking to school who depended previously on the peacekeepers watching on the roads? So we brought a resolution in on that. We brought a resolution in on climate and security. We represented the issues that others asked us to carry with us to the table. Mm -hmm. So we did it with conviction. We had to turn effectively our, the machine of our foreign ministry into support of the Security Council. So all of our missions across the world were on Security Council duty, as it were. Um, but because we do it once in every 20, 25 years, it's something that we were deeply proud of. Um, and that I think that we, uh, I, of course I'm a bit prejudiced since I was there, but I think we acquitted ourselves very well and managed to be that representative voice. So you tackled some of the biggest problems in the world. You mentioned the Taliban. You, you spoke out specifically on, on that. Um, you, you worked on the issues in Syria, Yemen, yes. Libya, Ukraine. Can you tell us about a moment 
when you felt like the council wasn't moving quickly enough? I think probably uh, on the Taliban mm -hmm. was the one that, well, two, Taliban and Ethiopia for very different reasons. Um, on the Taliban, what um, happened after the US, let's be face it, not an ideal withdrawal in the way that it was managed, although I accept the politics of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan was set in train under the previous administration. The Biden administration was implementing it but didn't do it well. There was, because of the way the withdrawal happened, there was this sense at the Security Council that we have to make this work, mm -hmm. you know, with the Taliban. And we were immediately vigilant around women and girls and what their rights would be. But there was such a humanitarian push and a you know, in our hearts were humanitarians that we felt arguing against giving the Taliban, as we were, cash to buy food and to, which was what was happening at the UN, would have been a sort of a, an anti-humanitarian instinct. So we decided to look for other ways to sanction the Taliban. And we set, and we were, I, I, I'm ashamed to say Ireland was alone in this, um, and I had many very difficult conversations um, with other members of the Security Council, even like-minded Western countries, including yours. Um, we tried to sanction the Taliban from traveling outside of their country because we've, we discovered that a number of the senior Taliban were sending their girls to school in Geneva. Oh, well, they, and well, most while they were to refusing to allow educated. girls to go, they themselves were traveling with their families. So sa the sanctions regime existed. So we want, there were a number of named Taliban on the list. And there were a number of them, I think it was like 50 or 60 who had the right to travel. We tried to take names off that list by way of protest against what was happening. Mm -hmm. And we got zero support. It was extremely mm -hmm. difficult to do. We finally managed to get, after months of trying to get a number of names off that list. In other words, they were not allowed to travel. That's a small example of a, of a way that just took a huge amount of political effort. The other one I mentioned there is Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia wasn't, there are a set number of countries which are what we call on the agenda of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. No country wants to be on the agenda of the Security Council. <laughs> Some have been like Syria for a very long time. Ukraine was not on it until the 24th of February in 2022. But Ethiopia was determined not to go on the agenda, but they were behaving in an extraordinarily vicious way with the Tigrayan people in northern Ethiopia. They managed to uh, cut off supplies of any aid, food, um, they were cutting off, uh, there, I mean, there was, a, uh, there was a conflict, an open conflict with the Tigrayan military, um, but we tried to get, not even to get them on the agenda, but to have a discussion, what we would call an informal discussion, and it took us weeks and weeks of negotiation. Russia and China protected Ethiopia, and since the permanent members have a veto, uh, if we asked for a discussion on Ethiopia, the Russians and the Chinese would put up their hands. So it took us months to even get the issue discussed. So when you say not moving quickly enough, sometimes it's not even being willing to discuss an issue. Um, so it's an uphill struggle for a country like mine, which had conviction but no veto. Among ambassadors to the United Nations, women are still a minority. How would it change the United Nations or the UN Security Council to have more women at the table? What would be the impact on diplomacy if that it's happened? Be positive. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, while I was on the Security Council, we actually had five women, which mm -hmm. was really uh, interesting. So I convened several times what we called the G5 dinners. Um, uh, it was a double entente because it was also the girl, the five girls. Uh, so um, we used to actually, and we and we had a WhatsApp group amongst us. Um, our our non-female colleagues were. Uh, hugely intrigued by what we were doing in this WhatsApp group. <laughs> and uh, importantly, what were we talking about at dinner? 
Um, so uh, we, you know, the, the women who were on the council at the time included the United States, the United Kingdom, myself, one of the smaller island states, and the Norwegian representative. So we were a good mix. Um, so, but the truth is we didn't do business over dinner. We just, but we did speak about how business was going. So we didn't do business, but we, we informed each other about how, what works and what doesn't work in, in a very you know, mutually supportive way. Um, you know, there are 193 countries in the UN, and of those 193 ambassadors, 40 of us were women. So we were thrown on our own uh, company a little bit. Um, I think there's a... I, I admit I'm so I've always I've been a woman a long time, <laughs> so um, I'm not I can't claim to have lived the uh, on the other side of the equation, but I will say that I think that w the the women's uh, sort of the, the more female instinct to listen and negotiate mm -hmm. rather than to um, uh, project and demand mm -hmm. is a much more uh, useful skill in diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, there, I'm sure it's true statistically that we tend, although I'm not doing it now, to speak less um, than our male colleagues and, you know, sometimes to rush to get to the point where we actually see a practical outcome. Um, now, sometimes in diplomacy, that's, you know, you need to keep talking, so I'm not saying it's the only route through, but um, we've seen, particularly in the broader area of women, peace and security, we've seen that the inclusion of women in negotiations, for example, on ceasefires, mm -hmm. statistically it's true that if you have women involved in a ceasefire negotiation, you're likely to contract the amount of time it takes to get there. There's just a more practical and immediate side, whether it's because of our lived experience as women, whether it's a maternal uh, aside, I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's statistically true. Um, and we've also seen, of course, in the lo longer term, that peace agreements where women are involved just are more sustainable. And that has something to do with content. We can talk about that later. It's, uh, we saw that in Northern Ireland, yeah. Yeah, so I was interested in when you were talking about the group of women who would get together. You also, when you were ambassador in Paris, you convened a group of women ambassadors. What I, I see a theme here. What are you trying to do? Getting <laughs> <laughs> Mini revolution? No, not really, no. Actually, the, it was the, the, well, certainly the Security Council women thing was, you know, was a blindingly obvious uh, thing to do. We spent lots of time together. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a good opportunity to be out of school together. In Paris, it was a bit more transactional, what we did, mm -hmm. um, because as it happened at the time, um, the heads of the five big media outlets, um, uh, you know, the, the chief, the bureau chief for The Economist, for The Wall Street Journal, for CNN, they all happened to be women as well. Mm -hmm. And it was in a completely relaxed environment one night, someone said, Hey, they're all all these are all women, and we could talk to each other a little bit. So we did that in a just out of you know uh, opportunistic um, finding ourselves together. It was a great network opportunity for us in in France because um, you know France is is a is a very traditional hierarchical political system, and having uh, journalists who were able to duck and weave in and out, great intelligence gathering. We, of course, in our own way, knew certain politicians across the, the female group. And so we did quite a lot of transactional trading of intelligence and information. Um, it was always fun. Um, but there wasn't a, you know, a sort of a, a particular objective to it. But mm. we, enjoyed, we enjoyed our time together, for sure. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned Northern Ireland. And I want to turn to Brexit. Um, so how did Brexit threaten to derail peace on the island, and how do you view the impact of Brexit in Ireland today? Well, I'm, you know, I'm on public record, and I know a lot of Irish politicians are in saying that Brexit was a bad idea to begin with, it was a bad idea in the middle, it's a bad idea <laughs> as it ended up. Uh, there was no upside for uh, Ireland, certainly, in Brexit, and I would argue, um, although it was a democratic decision taken by the people of the United Kingdom, um, there aren't many upsides for the United Kingdom from Brexit, and I think um, anyone who looks at polls these days will see that there's been a certain revisionism uh, in the public sentiment around Brexit. The big risk to Ireland, of course, was that you know we um, 
became a peaceful island as partners with the United Kingdom at the EU table. I would some, somehow argue that peace became possible not only because of the great work the United States did um, with everyone from Jimmy Carter to Reagan to Bill Clinton and George Mitchell, but also because British and Irish uh, politicians got used to each other in Brussels. We sat at the same table. Frankly, we shared a lot of the same views. We're similar economies, you know, open liberal trading partners. We shared views on tax. We shared views on a lot of things. The political classes came together. It made peace between Ireland, uh, United Kingdom, and Northern Ireland, just an easier conversation. So there was a three-way, there was a sort of a, a house of Europe that allowed us, and John Hume was always an advocate for that European dimension to growing our future together. When the United Kingdom decided to leave, for the first time, we saw the possibility that we could end up back on the island of Ireland with a border back on that island. And by definition, that was uh, an alert for, um, first of all, inconceivable that we would go back to an island I grew up in with bo a border that was manned by military people, um, you know, dividing the island of Ireland again. If you travel, those of you who have traveled on the island of Ireland, you'll see you pass from north to south. The only difference these days is a ping on your phone if it changes a carrier. You don't know where the border really is on the island of Ireland. The reason there would have been a need for a border was related to trading arrangements and the fact that um, the European Union has a single market. We have free passage of goods, people, capital, uh, uh, investment, without any borders, they're invisible borders. And um, once the United Kingdom decided to withdraw from the Union and from the Customs Union, basically we, the European Union had to settle uh, with the United Kingdom how we would manage the passage of goods, people, services in and out. It was a very difficult exit uh, for the United Kingdom. I don't think anyone in Brussels, certainly not in Dublin or London, anticipated how challenging that negotiation would be. I have to say, when we look back, it was a little bit naive of us that we didn't think this was going to be the most complex thing to unwind a highly integrated system. So in that, we had to carve out a special arrangement, or at least the United Kingdom and Brussels had to carve out. Ireland was not part of that negotiation. And I think the really interesting thing that maybe got lost here in the United States was that there was a certain political view in London in particular that once this got going, that Ireland would be forgotten and Northern Ireland wouldn't really... Northern Ireland wasn't even a big issue during the campaign for Brexit, you know, for the referendum for Brexit. So there was a sense that maybe this would all get forgotten and washed under and they'd sort that out somehow. But the European Union stood full square with Ireland from beginning to end in terms of the preservation of peace on the island. The Good Friday Agreement became sacrosanct. You know, there are people I know in Estonia and in uh, Lithuania who know about the Good Friday Agreement because of Brexit, because they, they recognized how important it was to um, maintenance of peace on the island of Ireland. I have no doubt. We saw during the immediate post-Brexit period a lot of, I'll be generous and say, uneasiness moving towards insecurity on the island. And that was born of a sense that we could go back, um, which was something that nobody on the island wanted to countenance. You, the, um, the United States stood as a firm partner to us, with us, in Ireland throughout that negotiation also. And I have to say, Speaker Pelosi was one of the ones who spoke out most uh, directly and said there would never be a trade agreement with the United Kingdom uh, that could in any way threaten uh, peace on the island of Ireland. So Brexit is done. The Windsor framework exists. It's what the, the framework that now manages that trade arrangement. It still has ragged edges. And I think it's going to be something, the, the new Labour government in the United Kingdom has said that they will work more closely with Brussels. And I think Brussels is ready to do that. But it, even that, in, in a goodwill way, is not easy. The European single market's remarkable 
uh, for what it delivers, 550 million consumers in a single market. You think of your own um, differences state to state here. We have 27 sovereign member states who negotiate this. Unpicking the tiniest part of that is very complex. And anyone who's ever done trade negotiations knows that that's even more complex than anything else. So I hope that Kerr Steimer finds a way to you know, take, take away some of the most ragged edges. And in particular, he knows Northern Ireland. Unlike some of his predecessors, he has actually worked with us. He has spent time in Northern Ireland. He did human rights work in Northern Ireland. So I'm optimistic that this new reset in London will be helpful. But I will continue to believe that um, it was David Cameron as Prime Minister who made the call to have a referendum that everyone from Dublin to Berlin to Paris begged him not to do, that it was not the right call. Shifting gears a little bit, there are more than 30 million Irish Americans, and that includes a number of African Americans. Can you tell us what is being done to connect African Americans to their Irish ancestry? Yeah, it's such a, I find it such an exciting part of our diaspora. Um, you know, across the globe, we're 70, 70 million Irish. Um, so we've gone far and wide. Uh, here in the United States, if everyone in Texas put on a green T-shirt, you'd have our diaspora, and the Irish diaspora is 30 million. It's only in the last decade, really, that we've begun to understand that 30% of African Americans have Irish DNA. And that is, um, it's both extraordinary and complex, um, because the history and the reasons for Irish DNA are linked to indentured uh, servants, slaves. Um, and, you know, we, I have personal friends, Deborah Kennedy, an African-American uh, who, you know, has uh, no idea where the Kennedy part of her heritage came from, but she loves to identify as Irish. We, Lonnie Bunch, who is the head of the Smithsonian, has just come back from a trip to Ireland where he has traced his roots to the Doherty family in Donegal and has actually seen the keep, the keep where a Doherty mercan, you know, mercantile um, um, trade, trade, trade man, trade, no, what am I saying? Someone who was a trader left, came over to the Southern United States and owned slaves. And so his own mm. family came through that issue. We increasingly understood that it wasn't just that we were seeing that there was a DNA link, but that there was an affinity link. Mm. And that people actually wanted to understand where their deep roots came from and wanted to associate with us. So we have f formed what we call the African American Irish Diaspora Network, Aiden for short. And uh, Aiden, I've just been in New York two weeks ago um, for a huge gala evening, about 300 black, brown, green, as we call us, uh, uh, <laughs> evening where we all come together. And, you know, we are now undertaking a lot of academic work. Um, uh, uh, Skip Gates uh, in Harvard identifies as Irish. His own roots mm. are Irish. So a lot of our academic friends in the African-American community are leaning in. We have very practical links. Two things I'll mention before we finish on this. One is that not known to many, but Frederick Douglass spent a year in Ireland. He actually went to Ireland remarkably in 1845. And he was attracted to Ireland by uh, Daniel O'Connell, who's known in Ireland as the Liberator, uh, who lived in Kerry. And um, he was a great orator, was also um, a rights activist at the time for Catholic emancipation and the beginning of our, what ultimately became a civil rights movement, if you trace the line all the way to John Hume. Douglas uh, moved around Ireland with absolute freedom and comfort, and he, had, he was then a free man. But he said it was the first time, and in his biography he says, the first time he felt like a man was when he was in Ireland. Um, fast forward to John Hume, who struck up an extraordinary friendship with John Lewis, two civil rights activists mm. who saw their own societies move out of oppression into fulfilling a rights-based agenda. 
And so we have translated that, for example, into we have several Frederick Douglass scholarships. We have a hugely active partnership between our best, our biggest and our best business school in Ireland, the Smurfit Business School and the Howard University. So in fact, on the night I was in New York, it was two nights after Kamala Harris had um, conceded on the grounds of Howard. I was sitting with the Dean of Howard, um, who was telling me how emotional it was on that evening, but also how wonderful it was for the students who are now in and out of Ireland. Black-owned businesses do a huge amount of business with us yeah. because they feel that there has been a sort of, um, I think, a, you know, a, an understanding as oppressed people, a little bit like sometimes the Palestinian question, why are we... Uh, why do Irish people lean more into African America or into Palestine? I think peoples who have had their um, their rights denied and have been oppressed find community together, and I think that's a big part of the African American story. Well, um, I'm in a book club here in Austin, and a number of us love reading Irish authors um, like Paul Lynch, oh. Sally Rooney, Colm Tobin, and I wanted to ask you, what role do you think the arts play in diplomacy? Well, in Irish diplomacy, I would say an outsized role. Um, you know, we are by nature and by definition storytellers. You know, that's how we have crafted our expression. You know, even if you go back to, um, you know, Yeats and Beckett and Joyce, they all sought a place where they could express themselves, tell their stories. At the time in Yeats, Joyce Beckett, it wasn't a very conducive environment in the early days of Irish independence. They actually found their place in France. And so while I was ambassador in France, I was always grateful that France had offered that opportunity. We're in a different environment now uh, in Ireland. And so we are now, of course, our, our doors are open for our new generation of young writers. You mentioned spectacular ones there. I was just with Paul Lynch last weekend in Dayton, Ohio, where he he's the Booker Prize winner from last year for a, an exceptional work, which I'd recommend, Prophet Song, which contextually for, for everyone on the globe right now, it's a, a bit of a wake-up call. Um, but he won the Dayton, Ohio Literary Peace Prize, the Richard Holbrook Prize, um, for his work. And I was there because you know, it's part of how we want to be understood on the global stage, that the expression of Irish identity and values comes through in our writers. Northern Ireland's a very good example. We were, Robbie, we were just talking about this earlier, where writers like Heaney, Muldoon, poets in large, um, Longley in Northern Ireland, became the voice of pain and suffering in the troubles without ever addressing the troubles, or at least Heaney didn't directly, but he was the voice of that generation. Now, Ireland, you know, for our young, dynamic, 21st century progressive self, we have Sally Rooney with normal people or conversation with friends. Um, Colin Tobin, who has captured the loveliness as well as the horror of our um, emigration experience. And in his Irish. new work, Long Island. Long Island with Eilish. His Eilish. 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 character from yes. both Brooklyn and That's right. Long you, Island. Uh -huh. You see her evolution mm -hmm. in the emigrant experience. And I think warts and all, we're, we're now mature enough as a society to look, you know, there was a terribly, at one point we had what we call the Irish wakes and people left Ireland, you never heard about or from them again. And their stories didn't emerge, really, in our literature in the early 20th century. Um, they, there was a gap. People like Alice McDermott, somebody mm -hmm. else to read, who has captured that 50s, 60s onward immigrant experience um, that you know, was so pivotal to the emerging modern economic Ireland as well, because these people were sending money home, helped us to grow economically. But they were also you know, sharing their own lived experience. You see that with Eilish in Brooklyn when she went back, how she was, you know, helping to reshape some of her local society yeah. because of her own she experiences. Experience exactly. Yeah. So it's a very, uh, it's an interactive thing. And I think on the silver screen, we're now, I'm as likely to be asked, to be frank, about Yeats 
and Joyce, I'm much more likely to be asked about the Derry Girls <laughs> or about Paul Mesco, uh, um, uh, Killian Murphy. Uh, we had 20% of the acting nominations in the Oscars last year. Um, we also have a really vibrant um, industry. So we're, we're, our writers are doing brilliantly, but so are those who are translating our stories onto the silver screen. And we have invested as a, as a country in our film industry. Uh, you know, it was a slow burner for about 20 years and suddenly we now seem to be flourishing on the island at the moment, they're making Bodkin, Bad Sisters, if anybody has seen Bad Sisters. Um, the Derry Girls, I still hope, might find a follow-up. I've been talking, there's a rumor that she might look at Irish America, which I think would be fantastic. Um, it, it, there are several other um, productions underway in Ireland. You saw Conan O'Brien just went to Ireland and did an Always Sunny in Philadelphia series. You should watch it, it's very funny. Um, but we are emerging, and that expression so is breaking out. So, you know, it, it couldn't do it easily in the early 20th century, and people like Joyce Yates, poor old Oscar Wilde, you know, uh, and they had to leave Ireland to find full expression. It's so wonderful that we can now own it, and own it proudly, um, and uh, we'll continue to do that, I hope. Wonderful. Well, I want to go to questions in a moment, but first, can you tell us, how is your life exactly like the Netflix show, The Diplomat? And how is it not like the show? I'll tell you two things. I haven't yet gone skinny dipping. <laughs> yet. Okay, okay. But interestingly, the, uh, Deborah Kahn, who wrote the series, asked to come and I did a, an event with yes. The Diplomat. Yes. So I sat with the American ambassador and her very handsome husband, um, <laughs> uh, who's Welsh and has Irish connections, which made him even more handsome <laughs> in our view. Um, you know, I, I was honest with them as I am there. There are so many parts of that that I could identify with, you know, um, uh, the, the midnight calls, the trying to work out what people are saying because we speak in tongues, we speak in coded ways mm. as diplomats. Um, I've, you know, I've never stood beside a car that exploded and oh. there's some of it that, <laughs> and certainly I never left my post to go into another diplomat's area, this inside the Beltway point about the ambassador in London arriving in Paris, that would cause ructions <laughs> in any diplomatic service. And I don't have a private jet, oh. sadly. <laughs> Um, but the day-to-day, -day, the chores, the, the way in which you see her bringing the whole of government together, um, the, the moral torpitude that she faces, you know, there are, uh, as diplomats, some of our work is, is very pedestrian and it's not as exciting as it looks, but there are days where you're really tested and I think you see that in her as an individual and the anguish that she goes through in terms of decisions she has to make or how you handle what you know, what your government understands at any one time. It does show very well, maybe finish on this, that you know, in spite of all of our technological advances and the ability to see each other in screens and that, nothing and nothing substitutes in diplomacy for personal interaction. Mm -hmm. And so the relationships you see she has with the politicians, with her own team, with people uh, in the UK, in this series, that is the essence of what we do every day. You know, you're only as good as your next uh, relationship is. You need, as the new administration comes in, I'll be pounding the pavements on Capitol Hill, hoping someone will listen to me, talk to me, not shut the door the second time. She shows you how that works. It's mm -hmm. not always a given. So, um, I, you know, I've, some of it's great fun and the midnight feasts and running around houses and, uh, as I say, skinny dipping. Not on the agenda, but there is a lot of it that's very good. To good to know, yeah. good to know. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Let's go to questions now from the audience. And I think Sarah will be coming around with a microphone. She's in the back. Let's go right here in the front, Sarah. Thank you so much for making a delightful evening for us. Um, Regardless of what happens with tariffs, I, I hope that an important part of my diet will continue to be Dubliner cheese. <laughs> On a more serious note, 
I got an email today from the Yale Climate Communications Project saying that they had just finished a, a survey of every county in Ireland as to the people's opinions about climate change, how serious it is, whether it's caused by human uh, activities and so forth. And from the numbers, it seems that Iowa is, uh, that Ireland is well ahead of the US in terms of awareness about climate. So my question is, what sort of climate policy does the Irish government have? And how do you think it will contrast or work with American policy? Look, um, it's an issue that's uh, probably one of the most pressing uh, both foreign policy issues, but I was holding my breath till you told me the result of that survey, but I'm not surprised <laughs> uh, that the Irish people see this as a big global challenge and an immediate reality. I mean, it's obvious on the island of Ireland, we've had a big weather episodes that are just completely out of sync with what we would normally see. We've had um, a Green Party in government for the last almost five years at the table uh, in, in Dublin. And they have made a huge difference in terms of writing into our domestic policy, very ambitious um, goals in terms of climate um, and climate adaptation and resilience, um, as well as mitigation of climate risk. Um, we're also hugely uh, active as international negotiators. The leader of that Green Party is currently in Azerbaijan as we speak, leading one of the biggest mm. sectors of the negotiation on behalf of the European Union. I'm not going to start rolling out because I always get them wrong, 30% reduction by 2030, and that will be 50% by 2050, and you add and you subtract. We are part of the European Union's biggest, most ambitious, uh, um, goals to uh, cut uh, climate emissions and to, um, to change our economies uh, in terms of the production of renewable energy. We have uh, a lot of, uh, as, you, as anyone who's been to Ireland will know, we have a lot of wind energy um, and we're doing our best. Our biggest challenge in terms of capture and storage uh, remains capital investment, um, but the Irish government has been very um, assiduous in looking ahead. We have um, put aside some resources in order to deal with future energy challenges. We're also um, you know, very anxious that the incoming administration doesn't step back from the Paris climate mm -hmm. accords mm -hmm. because we've already, as you know, missed uh, the international global targets. And for a country like the United States to withdraw will leave, uh, first of all, you know, China uh, is a, a huge polluter, but if the United, and they had actually been, to be frank, inside the tent in the negotiations. They may not have been reaching, China and India may not have been reaching the same ambitious targets the European Union wanted, um, uh, nor were you, frankly, as the United States. Um, you're the biggest emitter uh, internationally, but they were in the discussion. Um, I fear if the United States walks away from the Paris Climate Accord again, um, that we will see uh, the international climate um, uh, initiative uh, uh, dilute, if not disintegrate. Um, we believe in what we call climate justice in Ireland. We certainly believe that the global south is not responsible for the, the difficulties, and it is the most vulnerable. It's the global south, it's those small island states I spoke about, and it's women and girls who actually, uh, across every economy, it's women and girls who carry the burden of climate change. So we remain aggressive, I would say, as well as ambitious on climate. We are in wait and see mode now. Um, I'm not that optimistic for Azerbaijan, although they started out on a positive note. Um, I've had endless discussions. I'm also ambassador to seven uh, Caribbean states, and Barbados has taken a leading role for the Caribbean states on climate green financing. Um, and the World Bank has done some really good work recently. Um, we have been to the fore in uh, insisting that climate financing um, be properly uh, supplied and stocked, as it were. Um, we, we play our part, we pay our part. Um, the Global South shouldn't be asked to carry this. And, you know, generationally, I don't believe my son, who's, you know, 24, Leo, 
who's here with us tonight, um, one of our youngest audience members, um, watching his wonderful mom on stage. Leo shouldn't have to carry the burden of climate change into his young adulthood. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, let's see, let's go back here. Uh, you. <laughs> Uh, hi, Ambassador. Thank you so much for coming to Texas. Um, you mentioned Irish affinity for Palestinians. Uh, I'm curious if you face any challenges in your role, uh, given what many view as U.S. complicity in that situation, and if so, how you address those. Sorry, could you just say, I heard, do I face a challenge? Could you repeat the last part? Yes, yeah, sorry. Do you face any challenges in your role as ambassador to the U.S., uh, given what many view as... U.S. complicity in the situation in Palestine? Well, look, I mean, first of all, um, we think the situation currently in, in Gaza, um, in Israel, Gaza, and Lebanon is untenable and unconscionable. Um, the attacks on the 7th of February were absolutely brutal, horrific attacks. October. Sorry, what did I say? Sorry. February. February, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm in Ukraine, 7th of October. In, at the music festival, thank you, um, were horrific. Irish ministers were straight out to say that that was just, we can never have that happen again. And the hostages should be brought home. We lost an Irish citizen mm -hmm. um, on the 7th of October. And indeed, a beautiful young uh, Irish uh, Israeli child was, uh, was a hostage. She was released early on, but we know there are we don't know how many hostages there are still alive, frankly, but whoever uh, is still alive should be brought home to their families. However, um, we would believe that the right of a Palestinian child to live is as equal as the right of a, an Israeli child to live, and we absolutely cannot stand over what has been an abrogation under any judgment of uh, the human rights, the humanitarian access, um, and uh, the disproportionate attacks we've seen in Gaza. Um, over 40,000 people have died in Gaza. We don't know what the situation inside looks like. We haven't had access. Ireland has been to the forefront of our arguing for a ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire, return of the hostages, and importantly, the beginning of a political dialogue. We believe, you know, we see our history in the history of Israel. You know, they're a, a, a wandering tribe. Ireland sees itself as not having had its own homeland for a very long time. We saw ourselves recover our nationhood um, in the 20th century. We recovered our language, just like we've seen the Israeli people do. President Herzog was born in Dublin. Uh, you know, there's a very strong attachment to Israel. My colleague in Washington, who will probably move off soon, Michael Herzog, speaks with a sort of a bit of an Irish accent. So we have deep links with Israel. But there is no foreign policy issue in Ireland that attracts as much public support as the um, seeing the, uh, the destiny of the Palestinian people realized as a full sovereign state um, with equal rights. So we believe in a two-state solution. Um, I will say that, you know, watching what's happening right now, um, you know, the destruction in Gaza, the settlements in the West Bank, which we are, have always argued are illegal, um, it's very hard to see next steps uh, to deliver a two-state solution. But Ireland took the, uh, along with Spain and a bit later Slovenia, um, the decision to recognize Palestine as a state earlier this year. And that was a moment where, to your question, did it make my job more difficult? If you had told me when I was in New York I would be coming to Washington and we would be recognizing Palestine, that would have been a big deal. <laughs> because, of course, it's not something that I would expect to be universally welcomed, even by a friendly administration like the Biden administration. Um, on the other hand, the context was such that I think there was much greater understanding for why Ireland would take a principled position like that, why we would support uh, the judgment of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, which has um, called, you know, called out Israel and delivered a judgment against Israel in terms of its behavior uh, in 
both in the West Bank and now in, in Gaza. So my job isn't made more difficult. It, it made, uh, there's a, I, I always feel it's, it's important that I get a chance to explain that being uh, supportive of a Palestinian state is in no way inimical to Israel. In fact, if anything, I would argue that until there's a Palestinian state, Israel will never have peace and security in that region. It's the unfinished piece of business in that region. I'm not a defender of Hamas. I don't know of any Irish politician who would stand up for the terrorist and the brutality of Hamas or Hezbollah in Lebanon, where we have been for over 50, well, almost 50 years now as peacekeepers. We don't defend those Iranian uh, uh, active uh, Hezbollah militia in Lebanon. But we do recognize that Israel is in a very uneasy region. And the way to go about securing your own borders is not to massacre the people on either side of your border. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. And I saw a hand over here. The first question uh, answered my question. Oh, I'm sorry. I pointed to a woman oh, behind you, actually. Um, could you touch briefly? I know that um, Ireland borrowed money from the EU and then uh, invested in infrastructure and education within the country, and it, it, it had uh, tremendous positive effects in the country. Um, and then if that uh, led into your... I know the Irish people have been very welcoming to some of the Ukrainian refugees as well. So if you could just touch on those sure. things. Thank Absolutely. You. Well, on the second point, first, maybe the Ukrainian refugees. Um, you know, we have said, I think I said it myself in public today earlier, we will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Um, we believe that um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine was literally contrary to everything we believe in. It took us a long time to win our sovereignty, uh, to be independent. We are very attached to that. The idea that someone... Just think of it, a bigger country who thinks you are invadable because you have a similar history and language. That doesn't sit well in Ireland, believe you me. Um, so um, we... Just, uh, 1,000 days ago, was imagine, exactly, mm -hmm. imagine, the invasion. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, what we have done immediately, uh, like I sat on the Security Council on the night of the invasion, and although Anthony Blinken and President Biden had said several times, this is coming... The fact was the international community didn't really believe it. So we were called in for a late night meeting of the Security Council and the Russians ironically were chairing it. Um, and um, you know, we were told it's happening and we none of us believed it and our phones started to light up, including the Russian phones, mm. to say this happened. Mm. On that day in the 24th of February, 2022, there were a handful of Ukrainians in Ireland Today, there are 110,000 Ukrainians in Ireland. That's almost 2% of our population. I say that because in some countries, there were already big Ukrainian populations. And there was, in the United States, for example, many of the people you took in here joined existing families and structures. We had absolutely no Ukrainian presence in Ireland. So we have welcomed largely women and children, but there are families in Ireland. They have immediate access to our education system, to our health care, to the labor market. Um, none of those people want to be in Ireland. You know, they did not choose to leave our, of Ukraine. So I expect they will go back in a heartbeat when this conflict is over. But that conflict has to be on Ukraine's terms. It has to be ended on Ukraine's terms, not Moscow's terms. And that's where we have a, a potential future difference with the incoming administration. We believe that President Zelensky um, needs to be supported and that he, he comes to the table when it's, the time is right for Ukraine. To go back to your earlier point on the support Ireland rece received from the EU, you know, I don't believe Ireland would be the country it is today if we hadn't made the decision in 1974 to join the European Union. In my lifetime, it was the best decision Ireland has ever taken. It transformed us, I mentioned, the social impact it had, where women, um, you know, didn't have to resign if they married, um, where um, we introduced equal pay for equal work. It was an obligation 
on us uh, to do that as we joined the European Union. And in the early days, we had what was called aid, or it was called regional aid, structural support for developing our society. And I think the clever thing we did, um, um, I don't know if there's anyone here from the IDA, but I think it may have been an IDA idea, said we put our money into our brains and not all into the roads. And that's true because some European countries um, came and invested in infrastructure as one, um, I won't say which country it was, an ambassador said to me, we built roads that went nowhere. Um, we built schools, we built um, you know, infrastructure around towns that supported development of our economy. And the European Union was by far the biggest boost modern Irish economy and society has had uh, in the 20, in our whole history, actually. Um, so it's been a, a threshold, a landmark uh, decision we made, which is, to double back to your point about Brexit, what made Brexit so difficult for us to understand, the Irish people are European in their nature. We think of ourselves as Europeans. Um, the idea that, you know, there would be breakaway, you know, there was this flippant idea particularly in the UK, that, well, if we're leaving, surely you should do that too. There is nothing uh, uh, further from the minds of Irish people than uh, diluting or leaving, uh, diluting its relationship or leaving uh, the European Union. We, if you look at any of the barometers of support, we're right up there. And it's not any longer because of the money. Um, excuse me. <coughs> Ireland now puts more money into the European Union than it receives for what we call a net contributor. But it's all because our values, our principles, the way we go about business is support. Well, actually, we're, this is actually the perfect time. We're wrapping up anyway. And I wanted to, um, I, I want to invite everyone <coughs> immediately after this, we're going um, to we're gonna all go in the back for some refreshments. And I hear there's Guinness. <laughs> so it should be good. Um, did I interrupt your last point, though? Are you? OK, you're good. OK, Th please join me in thanking the ambassador. Yeah.